E-Mail-Marketing. Ja, genau, das ist das, wo Sie jetzt denken, ach, diese ungefragten Mails. Nein, genau das meinen wir nicht. Wir meinen jetzt wirklich E-Mail-Marketing, was seriös funktioniert. Einige werden auch unseren Newsletter bekommen, unseren Expert-Letter, den wir einmal in der Woche verschicken. Und der wird sehr gut angenommen und sehr gut gelesen. Wir haben so gut wie nie Menschen, die sich austragen. Die Frage ist natürlich, wenn Sie jetzt selbst sowas vorhaben, wie funktioniert denn vernünftiges E-Mail-Marketing? Und dazu haben wir uns mit einem Experten zusammengesetzt. Nathan Littleton macht Zeit seines Lebens nichts anderes als das, nämlich Credibility-Marketing, also Glaubwürdigkeitsmarketing und eben dazu auch E-Mail-Marketing. Ein wichtiger Teil davon ist eben, wie es aufgebaut wird, wie ich es dann entsprechend auch benenne. Und all das werden wir jetzt mit ihm hier besprechen, denn er hat sich für uns Zeit genommen. Der internationale Experte Nathan Littleton heute hier für Sie. Das Interview wurde in englischer Sprache durchgeführt. Credibility and email marketing. I can tell you how my day started. It is now not even noon and today I received 55 unsolicited emails from different people who emailed me and I still wonder why they do it. On the other hand, when we look into studies, email marketing is still by far the most profitable and most efficient way to get in touch with clients, gener generate leads or even sell your services. So the problem is, where shall we go? I have an international expert here with me today. Hello and welcome, Nathan Littleton. Hey, Niels, great to be with you. Thank you very much for taking the time. So when it comes to email marketing, you are an expert on that on an international level. Um, why do, in your opinion, people still send me unsolicited emails? These are clearly people who, who sent me an email which I did not agree on in the first place. Why do people do that? It's a great question. And I, I think there are two camps of people who are using email marketing. There's those people that you mentioned who are deciding that they're going to send out to as many people as they possibly can, irrespective mm. of whether they've asked for it. And then there's the other people who are doing things right. So those who are sending unsolicited solicited emails, it's almost taking the approach of if I throw enough mud at the wall, hopefully some of it will stick. Whereas yeah. to use email marketing effectively, what we really want to do is build a list of people who know who we are and trust what we say. It, mm -hmm. it seems like common sense, but you're right. There are so many people who are sending unsolicited emails that it can't be common sense. Yes. So um, taking the, the classic approach, I go to a networking event. I have 15 different business cards in my hand afterwards because I talk to people in one way or the other. Do you think it's okay to put someone on my email list or on your email list or on who else email list? just because I got their business card. It's always going to be a, a moral ch choice that you need to make. I think no. Um, I think it's far more effective and you'll get a much better response in the longer term. If you're asking those people, look, I send this kind of information, X, Y, and Z, hints, tips, educational resources around my subject area, would mm -hmm. this be of interest to you? More mm -hmm. often than not, you'll get the response that is yes, because the content that you're hopefully creating is content that you know your audience will want to hear. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, why not ask them if they want to receive that in the first place? The, the worst possible thing that could happen is they say no, and then you say, that's great, we'll have a nice day. Yeah. Excellent. So you are managing email newsletters for quite a significant amount of companies and people by yourself. What, in your opinion, is the way how to do I know this is a very broad question, but how to do email marketing right? It is a broad question. And I think uh, another way of looking at this is by looking at all the ways that people do this wrong. And I try not to focus too much, too much on the negative here, but it does help us to understand the correct way of doing it. Because when I see companies and individuals using email marketing incorrectly, it's because they're missing one of three pillars. So to take the spin on that, and here's how we do it correctly, you do need all three of those pillars. So the first is to build a list. And as we've touched on briefly here, it's building a list of people who know who you are and mm -hmm. would recognize your name if it landed in their inbox. Mm -hmm. The second of those pillars is serving that list with educational, valuable resources that are going to be useful to them, that are going to help them to either fix challenges that they have within their life or their business, or it's going to help them to maximize opportunities that could possibly be there. And the mm -hmm. third pillar is to extract the opportunities from that list. Where you've provided them with educational resources, valuable information, it then becomes a service to them to be able to recommend products or services that will help them to take the next step and to get better results. 
Mm. So when we when we start with this, let's let's start with the list building. Um, I mean, when I look at the list of companies you work with, Microsoft, BBC, these are really prestigious companies who don't easily trust people with their with their email marketing or hiring someone to speak at their conferences. But many people struggle to say, how can I build a list of, let's say, a couple of hundred people? It's quite tough to get this amount, these amount of email addresses. I could pay someone, so I buy addresses first. Would you recommend that? What is your take on how to build a proper email list? I certainly wouldn't recommend buying lists. It should always be the last resort. It's not to say that it can't work, but this is a list of people, if you've purchased a list, who have no idea who you are. So you're well on the way there to get a high number of unsubscribes and a high number of spam reports. Mm -hmm. One of the common ways that you see that people do build a list is by putting a box on their website that says, sign up for my newsletter. Mm -hmm. Now, Niels, I'm sure you're like many other people here. When's the last time you got excited by the prospect of receiving someone's newsletter? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a great way to go by asking people to sign up to a newsletter because people know what to expect when they put an email address into a website for a newsletter. They know that the information that's going to come in return into their inbox is going to be pretty useless. So mm. it's far more effective to do one of two things, either position the content that exists within a newsletter and the value that it brings. So be specific around the hints and tips around a specific subject area. Mm -hmm. Or in addition to that, you can also provide what's known as a lead magnet. That is an educational resource in the form of a, a package that has high perceived value. So it could be an ebook, it could be an audio, it could be a video in exchange for that email address, but also manage expectations around what they can expect going forward. So in addition to receiving the lead magnet, here's what they'll receive on an ongoing basis. This is all just to be about being upfront and honest around the relationship that you're going to have with them. Mm. Of course, now some people will say, well, on the other hand, it's nice to have a lead magnet, but I don't want to give away my best stuff for free because that, that, that's what the, the, these potential customers or clients should pay me for. So how do I, how do I well, balance this properly to say, I, I make a nice lead magnet because we all know that these lead magnets are overused by people who often deliver very little value. You get a one page of PDF with 50 words on it and you just leave the whole uh, website immediately. How do I do it properly to um, make a good lead magnet without giving everything away? That, that's a great point. You're right. There are a number of people who will say, well, I don't want to give away my best knowledge and expertise. Actually, I think you should give away your best knowledge and expertise. That's How the do I make money then? <laughs> well, it's going to give you credibility by making sure it's your best content. The mm -hmm. way you position that into making money is the thing that you give away, as well as being your best, it should be just one thing. It should be one thing that's easy to implement so that it builds your credibility and lets people know that you're good at what you do. So mm. the next step in terms of them paying for a product from you, there's far more than you, that you know other than just one best thing. So that's the one thing you give away in a lead magnet that leads them through the, to the next stage where they want to work with you. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the... Um, often used terms of a sales funnel. People give you your email address and then you drag them through a sales funnel. I receive about two to three offers per week of people offering me different kinds of sales funnels. And it always looks a bit like they try to give me a system which is like this one size fits all kind of sales funnel where they claim it always works. What is your take on sales funnel? Do you like them? Don't you like them? And if you like them, how do you think they work properly? Sales funnels are incredibly effective. That's, there's, mm -hmm. there's no mistake around that. But I'd rather just change our thinking around what a sales funnel is and use the term value ladder instead. So if mm -hmm. we understand that someone needs a little bit more trust in us than to be able to buy from us at the first interaction, we need to give them something that lets them know we're credible and we're good at what, the, uh, at what we do. So the first thing will be a freebie at the top of the sales funnel, for want of a better phrase. We then take them through the process of a smaller purchase and it's just holding their hand to get them to the point where they have what they need to fit their objectives. So you're right, not everyone will fit into a one size fits all sales funnel. So the, the, the way that we go about this in the right way is to make sure that each person who has different challenges, different opportunities, that we're guiding them through the process, holding their hand through the process of getting them what they need to best fit their challenges or opportunities. Mm, excellent. So when we talk about email newsletters now, 
of course, and um, the accent might have given it away, as you can hear, I'm German and you know that and some listeners will know as well. Of course, when it comes to newsletters, people always ask, how long should a newsletter be? And as, as in my absolute Germanic way, I have to ask you for the specific number of words I should use per newsletter. Could you please provide me with a solution there? Long newsletter, short newsletter, something in between? So as a general rule, you only say as much as you've got to say that's going to be valuable to your reader. Now, mm -hmm. despite, your, despite being German, I'm not going to give you a specific word count. But what I will do I expect is, that. <laughs> is I will give you a specific number of potential sections that you should have. Now, the approach that I take to newsletters isn't to have a set number of words. It's to make sure that if someone has one minute to read it or they have 15 minutes to read it, that they're going to get value from it. So mm -hmm. I always recommend having something in there that is very short and easy to digest so that if someone only has 30 seconds to read the email content, that they're going to get something from it. So I always encourage people to have some kind of quick tip in there, something that fits within 150 characters, 200 characters to, uh, to, to feed your hunger there for a fixed word count. Uh, mm. Yeah, if you can get something that's very short and easy to digest, that's a really good thing. And then the rest of the content can be suitable for those people who have a little bit of more time, a little bit more time to take in what we're giving them. Mm. So now, of course, we have at the moment a quite challenging situation where some people say our email marketing isn't working as well as it did before. Do you think that especially during Corona crisis, COVID-19, crazy name, COVID-19, crazy name it as, as you like it, would you think that the situation became easier, more challenging, different? What would you say is the development here? I think the, the challenge that I've seen with a number of the emails that I've seen that people have been sending is that they just haven't adapted to the different challenges that their readership have. If you're yeah. sending the same kind of content throughout this pandemic as you were six months ago, there's a real problem. And the reason there's a problem is because the people who are reading your content have very different challenges and opportunities to what they had six months ago. And mm. if you don't know what those challenges and opportunities are, ask your readers, ask your prospects, ask your customers. They're the best people to be able to tell you what's top of their mind right now. And in 90 to 95% of the time, I imagine it's something different to the answer that they would have given you six months ago. Mm. So um, when now people listen to this and they say, okay, might be a good idea to start email marketing, but it seems to be rather complex. It seems to be a lot of work. We have to do all the writing. Maybe we run out of content. We need someone to do it, either to do it for us or we have to do it ourselves, which means we need resources for that. And especially they seem... They, they, they often seem to be quite confused where to actually start. Where would you say, when, when people would now ask to wrap the interview up, the top three tips from Nathan Littleton, where to start with email marketing? Okay, so tip number one will be just start. <laughs> just okay. start. First because... question here, I have to ask, which tool would you recommend when people want to start? Because there are many tools out there. Of course, it's not really great when you just use Microsoft Outlook and send out a mass BCC email address kind of thing. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I know that some people do that. And I think you end up in many, many spam folders with that. Um, what, are, what are tools in your opinion, which people should consider? And what is your take, which is suitable for, for what kind of audience? Because there are hundreds of tools out there. There certainly are. And just to build on your point around BCCing with Microsoft Outlook, as well as, as getting put into spam folders, you also affect your ability to get your emails through in the future. And I don't just mean mass emails or newsletters. If sending a BCC email could affect your ability to get a proposal or a quote through in the future, I think mm. far fewer people would use that as a strategy. But that's yeah. for a, another day. Um, in terms of the tools that I do recommend, I recommend two in particular. The first mm -hmm. is Campaign Monitor. It's yeah. a fairly simple application. It's very similar to your likes of MailChimp or Aweber or Constant Contact, but mm -hmm. I think it's just dead easy for people to use. For those people who are new to email marketing, it's a great one to be able to use just because it's so simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for something that has a little bit more power and could be something that you can scale up to in the future where you're looking at marketing automation and complex pathways like that, then Active Campaign is the one that I recommend. It's an incredibly powerful tool for not a huge amount of money and it's reasonably easy, easy to use as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's point number one, just start. And we also have some tips on tools. So that's tip number one. Mm -hmm. Yes, tip number two would be don't uh, underestimate 
how important the subject line is. I see so many people who will spend a lot of time working on the copy of their email, making sure that it is going to be as effective as it can be, but then they just drop a subject line in with barely a moment's thought. Now, I'm sure your, your listeners will be familiar with the fact that when you're creating a piece of marketing copy, whether it be a leaflet or a direct mail piece or copy for a website, you mm. need to spend a huge amount of time on the headline because yes. it's the first thing that people will see. And that methodology there transfers to email marketing too. Your subject line is your headline. So that's the first thing people are going to see. And they're going to make a split second decision on whether they want to open your email or whether they uh, want to delete it. So you have to make sure that it's interesting and intriguing enough that people will do exactly that. You have examples which worked particularly well in the past or also examples of what to definitely avoid in the subject line? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a, an ebook that has the 20 best subject lines, of course. Um, but a few that are working particularly well at the moment. Okay, wait, are... wait, wait. I just have to just, so just theoretically, would you, when you have an ebook about that, would you, for our listeners, would you give that, only for our listeners, of course, would you, would you give that away, let's say, for uh, free? Yes, it is my lead magnet. It's, it's been in existence now for six or seven years. I've revised mm -hmm. it every year. Um, Yes, it's something that I give away for free because if you think about my set of circumstances as an email marketing professional, it's the one thing that I can give away that is easy for people to implement. They can just take a subject line, use it, see that it gets results. And if it does get results for them, which I know it will, it means that it builds and establishes my credibility. So can mm. you see how that transfers depending on what industry you're in? You want to give away something for free that is easy to implement, but shows that you're credible. Yeah. Excellent. So now some examples of what works particularly well, what worked well and what to avoid. So some subject lines that are working well right now are announcement is working very well. I've used that a few times in the last few months and the, the open rates are jumping by as much as five to 10%. Mm -hmm. Um, Brand new is a particularly good one at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. They're two positive subject lines that are working quite well. Believe it or not, the most effective that I've seen this year is cancel cancelled oh. as a subject line is working very very well have to be careful how you use it it has to be yep. relevant to the content in your campaign but it's working particularly well in terms of open rates right now mm. those that you might want to avoid i think are anything that gives away too much about the content of the email mm -hmm. so that tends to be what we put in subject lines is a summary of the email content And it seems to make sense because that's what we'd have always done in the 90s and the 2000s. If we were writing an email to a friend, the subject line would be the subject of the email. So mm. it seems to be common sense that that's what you do. But actually, that's not a great thing to do because people are making a decision on whether they're going to take action on your content before they've even seen it. They're going to oh. delete that or they're going to read it depending on what goes in that subject line. Mm. Excellent. Okay, so that's tip number two, subject line. And tip number three? Tip number three would be to ask your audience what content is most relevant to them. I know we've touched on this, but this is a, a point that I can't get across as important enough, especially now in the circumstance we, circumstances we find ourselves in. Ask your audience, both your subscribers, your prospects, and your clients, what content is going to be most useful to them right now. And it stands mm. to reason that your existing clients, who I presume are clients that you have chosen and you know that are good to work with, if they find a particular set of content useful and it's going to help them with their life or their business, if you're looking to find more people just like them, then you should create content that is going to be suitable for them. That's mm. how you build a list of people who know, like, and trust who you are. Excellent. Thank you very much. So of course, I'm going to put Nathan's contact data in the show notes of this podcast. So you can get in contact with him directly. If you have any additional aspects, which you like to talk about him, or if you want to work together with him, I know a couple of my friends in my industry who work with him and a couple of companies as well. That's how I met him. And that's how I know him. So I can highly recommend his work at the end of this podcast and interview. I can only say one thing, Nathan, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Niels. It's been a pleasure.